Ahoy, fellow functioning androids. And welcome aboard the Joy of Trek, an illogical podcast exploring the science labs and eponymous planets of Star Trek, all, all of it. it. I'm Kaki. I'm Kay. And being scolded by Stella is your chief engineer, Greg. Together we're on a mission through the Android Control Center of Star Trek to find the bluster in every swindler and the good in every episode. Even the patent violations. Because every episode must be someone's favorite, and that might as well be us. So arm your explosives and join us as we waltz into... The, the Joy, Joy of, of Trek. Trek. Oh, very good. Greg's been writing excellent uh, yes, scripts for very us. very much so. So we are doing original series, episode 208, I Mud. Or season two, episode 12, depending on like the production order and the airing okay. order and the preferred order are all a little bit, uh, oh, a it's little one of those, bit wibbly uh, wobbly. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately. Frack but I Mud is a, apparently an absolute classic. And this was recommended to us by a friend of our chief. Oh. Yeah. So Pico recommended I Mud saying, I'm a recent Star Trek fan and I'm going through every series of Star Trek in order they were released currently oh. on DS9. Damn. Wow. That's not very recent, then. I mean, if he's already made his way through seven seasons of Next Generation... Yeah, no, this, I mean, you know, binging yeah. is a thing. I know, but that's, still, that's there's really still quite a few hundred hours of television that we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it really that's is. True. Like, in the order of 200, coming up on 300 yeah. hours. So, oh, well, we'll, we'll see. Let's, let's interpret a recent as a not long term. But Oh, I wonder if Pico's also, like, doing the thing where, you know, some episodes of Next Generation and DS9... Came oh. out in the same week. Oh, very good point. That Whether you're be... doing that full experience mm. that, that some of us managed during the that initial would be run. Amazing, yeah. Okay. TOS's intentionally zany moments are often a blast, and this one's chock full of them. Watching the crew dance, act absurd to confuse the androids is one of my favorite moments in the entire series. Oh, this is so cool. Mm. This is this is someone who's like recently binged the whole original series oh, and, yes. and giving us that perspective. Oh, that's so cool. Chief Engineer Greg here. I have to chime in because there is a connection that I had to this episode that I wasn't sure about at first, and I had to talk with my brother and just make sure I wasn't just inventing a memory whole cloth or having some kind of holodeck malfunction because I was so sure. When I saw the image of Stella pointing at mud in a little, like, cage thing, whatever, I was like, oh... I recognize that. Why do I recognize that? So back in like the days where you ordered a subscription to get a VHS with two episodes on it from the Columbia House Video Club, my brother Zach had a VHS tape from that subscription that was iMud as well as the Trouble with Tribbles. And because the Tribbles episode was the one that I knew of and I remembered, I watched that, but I had to fast forward through or sometimes watch through. I think I probably did watch I Mud a couple of times, but it wasn't as like, oh, ha ha, there's funny things and Kirk's being like pelted with the triples with. So it was just a weird moment to watch some be like, oh, this is a childhood memory just completely unlocked here. So that's my little personal connection here that I'd forgotten about. Do you want to read the synopsis? Oh, it's, it's quite a long one. It's quite yes, a long TOS one. Yes, TOS 211, I Mud. Captain Kirk and the crew have a second run in with con man Harry Mud. This time, finding him as the king of a planet of androids. The Enterprise is captured and an android which takes the entire crew to uncharted planet in the galaxy. Kirk, Spock, Bones, Uhura, Scotty, and Chekhov land with the android on the planet to find Harry Mud as the king of the planet and about 200,000 androids to serve him. He reveals that the androids were lent to him to learn about uh, and serve humans and demand more specimens to Ew. serve man. No. Harry Mud plans to leave the entire crew of the Enterprise behind and take the starship. By unraveling the weak points of the androids, the crew of the Enterprise damaged the main control unit, Norman, reprogram the androids to serve their original purpose of settling the planet, how exactly is unclear, yeah. gain control of the Enterprise and leave Harry Mud behind to live with the humorous androids. Well, humorous is giving a bit of a... Uh, <laughs> giving them a bit of credit. <laughs> That's, uh... First aired on November 3rd, 1967, written by Stephen Candle, or Candell, directed by Mark Daniels, uh -huh. and guest starring Roger C. Carmel, best known for Harry Mud, ooh, and Cyclonus in the 1980s Transformer cartoon and movies. Oh. 
There's also Roger C. Carmel. In the background, you can hear also appearing in this episode, Pip the Podcat, who seems to have been having a little uh, squeak out with the uh, birds outside. Yeah, she's having a regular old aria. She's normally a very quiet pod kitty. Yeah. It's if a bit rambunctious. Yes. I noticed that you've been giving her more than the allotted chances that you said you were going to give yeah, her to well, calm she's down. Been, she's been pretty good. I mean, the, the, the whole just hanging on my knee for a moment there was not really a too disturbing thing. She's currently hunting spiders at the top of her cat pole. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, we do we like spiders? We're not in Australia. We can like spiders. Oh, yes. I, but, I mean, what does our opinion on spiders have to do with whether or not the cat hunts them? Well, maybe we should discourage her from it because the you know the yeah. enemy of my enemy is my friend, and my enemy is mosquitoes. Fair. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, I can, it's not like I can stop her. <laughs> okay, this was a really fun episode. Do you have any warp cores to oh, dump? Well, let's see. Yeah. I say we eject the warp core. Because I, I heard you writing down a factual inaccuracy. I mean, it's not really a factual inaccuracy, but like, you know, the race that built the androids, mm-hmm. their planet went nova. Yeah, their son went nowhere. How, how did that kill them? Caught them completely by surprise, and all of them lived on that one planet. The sons don't oh, accidentally yeah, go no, nova. That's true. You know? No, they anybody, died over the course of time. Yeah, anybody with the basis knowledge of stars, which you would assume of a space traveling species that builds fantastic androids, yeah. would be able to see that their son is approaching nova state. It like, usually only takes a few billion years or so. So you, it's not like it sneaks up on you. Well, neither does a <laughs> climate cataclysm, and yet. Yes, but we don't have starships to evade the climate cataclysm. I mean, well, some people we, are working on we, it, but... We have plenty of means. We have had, over over decades, plenty of means. Yeah. And a, a lot of forces have been... I mean, not to get, like, super dark, but it's it's Don't Look Up, you know, the uh, mm-hmm. uh, the excellent yeah, satirical yeah. film oh, about exactly this, the ability for a civilization to self-deceive. Yeah. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe they've, they've, they've you know, they were under the rule of King Alex Jones. Ugh. Yes, ugh. All right. Well, I don't think there's any other ones other than you know, like a proper the sexual android. politics of the 1960s are well, not oh, being excellent. Well, no, of course not. Mud is like blatantly sexist, and but they're not even playing it for laughs. They're just playing him as a blatant sexist. So you know, I can see that would be maybe I'm looking at it too charitable. But the fact that he is, you know, like oh yes, I suppose male androids also have their purpose. Mm, I mean, yeah, they sure do, don't they? Well, I mean, a lot of it, fanfics it, have oh, expanded it, uh, on the. I mean, it depends on how your tastes run, but yes, like Mud is obviously played off as a sexist pig. So that doesn't make the episode sexist, I'd say. Oh, I mean, just the society in which it's set, because, like, Chekhov oh, has right. the same inclinations, yes. and, like, Uhura is written that it, her a bit obsession shallow. is yeah. youth oh, and beauty. Eternal youth, yes. Uh, and being grabbed quite quite firmly by Kirk and, and, and training everyone, but, yeah, okay. And the only other thing is that I have is, like, that an advanced android can't handle a simple logic paradox. I know. It's just like, oh, yes. I mean, that's, like, fundamental computational uh, I mean there's no answer so yeah you sh- your AI should be able to like work around that like it, except that there's a paradox yeah but you know what I saw something that unfortunately I don't have uh, with me to share mm-hmm. it was a TV guide article about exactly this yeah about exactly this episode and like how was this population of 200,000 androids done well it was done with some sets of twins yeah they, a bit they, of split screen work a lot of some 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 clever trick photography yeah. as it uh, as was mentioned but like that little article was only a single page and had some cool behind the scenes photos like on seven different occasions did it try to explain what androids were oh. like <laughs> synthetic people the yes. uh, 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 artificial people the fabrics the replicas just to sort of settle into people's minds like robots were not a settled concept nor no, I in guess fact not. were computers Yes. So, like, this idea that there's a computer in charge of things would be new right. to a lot of viewers. That makes sense, yeah. Did uh, your little article also include the casting attempt at a pair of twins that they found on Hollywood Boulevard? <laughs> <laughs> and their cat. And their cat, yes. <laughs> Two ladies who were apparently walking, a set of twins who were, like, apparently working as prostitutes there and had the cat and they were brought in for a casting call and the cat completely scratched up the casting director's uh, skirt and they were not hired. They, they were not invited back. Oh, dear. So, close and yet so far so i think that's it for the uh for the for the, oh well i also have 
how did they escape the planet? Because they managed to shut down all of these androids, yeah. but that doesn't enable them to operate the transporter controls on the Enterprise overhead because well, they, the entire crew is uh, down here. Yeah, and but the planet itself has all size transporters. I mean, about said, like, I had some people beamed up towards the Enterprise, you know? Like, it makes sense that they, they have advanced technological systems there, which is going to lead to me another little bit of comment that I have later on. Oh, well, then we've sort of interrupted <laughs> yeah. all of each other's... Warp cores? Well, okay, actually, there's one more. Well, it's not really a warp, oh, but, okay. but, it, but it really touches on this point. It's like they make I a whole... we were reaching the they make, zero well, well, they cores. make a whole song and dance about requiring the medical supplies on the Enterprise, whereas Bones has literally five minutes before been waxing lyrical about the advanced state of the facilities that they have here. Why don't the Android just like, oh, what's wrong with him? What does he need? Yeah, we have that. Yeah, it's part of their <laughs> it's part of their ploy though, right. and, they, and they do show some disinterest. You know, he is human; he is for yeah. you to care for. Yes, which is also a bit. But of a also, weird it's like, oh, well, yeah, we need the supplies from the Enterprise. Okay, what do you need? We'll get them for you. <laughs> but yeah, all right, yeah. all right. Are you ready to dive in? Because mm. I fucking love this episode. Bring it on. Hit it. I kind of miss your hit it on. Now you don't do it anymore. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> hit it it on. came out so naturally <laughs> that one time. <laughs> All right. We open with Bones and Spock doing a little walk and talk in the corridor. Yeah, they pass a hunky gentleman who nods at them and then they turn to appreciate his bum and they sort of gossip about him like two schoolgirls appreciating a a hot boy's bum. Well, Bones mistrusts him uh, for a variety of reasons, which (laughs) also gives him a massive case of foot-in-mouth disease. Well, I know when something doesn't strike me right, he doesn't. Specifics, Doctor. Labels do not make arguments. Oh, very good, Spock. And then McCoy goes on to list all the qualities that this Mr. Norman has, who apparently has been on board for 72 hours, which he apparently shares with Spock. Yes. Spock, of course, gets the final dig in. Besides, he has avoided two appointments that I've made for his physical exam without reason. That's not at all surprising, Doctor. He's probably terrified of your beads and rattles. Effectively calling Bones a witch doctor. <laughs> yeah, saying that he's uh, avoided all of McCoy's like attempts at a, at right. a physical. Uh-huh. A, I mean, mm. I, I do believe that Spock doesn't have a very high opinion of human state of medicine. Huh. I do recall there being a bit of a contentious thing in that as a running gag, I guess. Because why would he make such a comment to Bones otherwise? Like... Yeah, they're very, well, they're very tsundere toward each other, right? They're right. very hot and cold. <laughs> and they like to provoke and tease one another. Yes. Oh, speaking of teaser, we're, on the, we're in the longest teaser in, uh, in Star Trek so, uh, heard, so yes. far. At well over five minutes. And this hunky Norman walks into this room full of switches. Yes. Knocks the guy out. Yep. Like, was that a hand wave or was that like a judo chop? I it went a bit quick yeah. for me to, to yeah. spot. He just, I mean, he does a lot of throwing around of the crew in the next few minutes. He yep. flicks a few buttons. He twists a few lamps. Because I notice he's doing the whole making hand motions over a panel and doing things. Yes. <laughs> there is excellent, excellent physicality. And they start to notice problems on the bridge. In yes. one continuous shot, starts with Kirk leaning over uh, Sulu's console after he's alerted. There's an unplanned course change being fed into the instrument, sir. Correct it. I can't, sir. They are trying to correct this. They uh, sent the uh, security division to secondary control or secondary helm or whatever it is that they call it. Auxiliary control, Auxiliary yeah. Auxiliary control, that's the one, yes. I guess it's the Battle Bridge. Yeah, it's this cute little set with magenta lighting here and there. And, yeah, Norman seems to know exactly what he's doing. Yes. Security arrives in that location. Finds just the speak. unconscious engineer there. Yeah. This guy, what was his name? Lieutenant Rowe. Okay. I don't generally shit on uh, people on this show, but he's a terrible actor. Like, he sounded like a robot. I mm. thought for, for a second, oh, so there's a second android. And right, it's, And yes. it's Lieutenant Rowe, and he's just less convincing. I didn't quite catch on to that fact that Norman was a robot because I had like, oh, he talks just like Kirk. And no, actually, I've got written, I've got written down he talks mechanically. But yes, then it turns out that he is a robot or an android, as we should call him, I suppose. Yes, but if we do that, then we have to call all the female ones gynoids or, or gynoids or gynoids. Oh, OK. Well, you know, android as in like right. man-like. Yeah, yeah. So robots... Well, I mean, that's like, you know, man, like, there, there's a whole thing of, like, mankind. Why shouldn't it be womankind? No, those, are, those, those two words have an entirely different... A woman isn't man with woe in front of it. It has an entirely different etymological background. Yes, but there is something to be said for why is the default for humanity... Right. ...the masculine is the default, and that's, mm. like, yeah, that is a cultural choice. Very that true. We can make, uh, that yeah, we can make very true. So these problems persist. 
Uh, and in fact, they spread. Auxiliary control, this is the captain. Auxiliary control, what's going on down there? Sir, auxiliary control is on total override. He goes knocking around people on engineering. It's a cool. Scotty fight. gets hung out over his console. Yeah, and he manages to squeak out with his last few calories of consciousness. Captain, oh, he's here, here, Captain. Oh, no, we hadn't guessed that. Like, we have an intruder on board, and suddenly engineering stops responding. Wonder where the intruder is going to be. I know. Kirk has been yelling futilely. <laughs> yes. into Scotty, Scotty, are you there? He's coming your way. Scotty, 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 yeah. Scotty. Like, put in a clip of just how many times he yells Scotty here. <laughs> Scotty, what's going on down there? This is the captain. Scotty, report. Scotty, the intruder is in your area. What's going on down there, Scotty? He's here. Scotty. 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 And uh, then finally Scott says, he's here, Captain. And then he goes, oh, security to engineering. Yes. Uh, he tells Spock to take over the bridge. And just as he's about to head out to engineering himself, Norman appears and stops him. Yes. He grabs him by the arm, which makes... Kirk look rather, like, disapproving. He's just like, how dare you touch me, unhand me, you ruffian. Uh, yeah. He doesn't say that, but that's, that's what his body language and look conveys to me. I think we're supposed to infer that it was a very painful grip and that he's yes. very, very tough and, like, concealing all the pain, and then he rubs his little arm to get the wrinkles out of his beautiful green tunic. Yes. With a lot of blinking, I noticed, Norman explains what he's done because he's oh, very... Right. He's completely still otherwise... Okay. I also noticed that, like, I don't remember exactly what the rules behind this, but Kirk is wearing his sexy green tunic yeah. with a, with a low-slung comb badge. Uh -huh. like, is this, like, an official, like, I mean, green is not a standard color, so is this, like, a custom uniform that he has made? What? He's worn it more often. I, I, know, I thought it was, like, like, the captain's uniform. Maybe that's, right, so uh, that was different for a while. I guess. Then he settled on Maybe, gold. Maybe, oh, I, guess, I guess I know what happened. It's like it used to be a golden uniform, but someone in the oh, service I, crew matched it up and washed them together with the blue uniforms, and then it took on a greenish tint, so that's I why agree. it's... <laughs> oh, yes, yes. No, I remember that fan fiction. After Spock slept over and their uniforms were in the hamper together. <laughs> <laughs> but we require your ship. You require... Who and what are we? Not having watched this before, I initially thought that Norman was going to be Mutt. Because I didn't know that there had been an interaction with Mutt before. And, and especially because of the way that he actively uh, managed to take Kago off the ship, which really mirrors uh, what we saw in uh, A Strange New Worlds. You know, Discovery. Discovery. Sorry, it was yeah. Discovery. Not Discovery Strange season yes. one, which yeah. we uh, which we recapped about a month before. or two ago, I suppose. Magic to make the sanest yes. man go mad. So there was, and there's a lot of similarities between the, the the way Norman conducts himself and the way Mud. Yeah. So he, he knows exactly how to take over a Federation starship. Right. I wonder where he learned how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right? That must have been during Discovery that he, he had all of those loops oh, yeah, to figure oh, yeah, of out. Course, because Discovery is before... <laughs> yes! That yeah, was very young good. Mud. Yes. Oh, great. So he figured out, okay, so first you go to Auxiliary Control, and then you go later on, and you type oh, in this, right. and, like, he had the zero-day oh. exploit. No, I think it's cool, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cano canonically, Mud, that happened before this. Yes! Very and good. so he was yeah. able to teach it to Norman, <laughs> who says that... And if you attempt to use your phasers, the trigger relay will be activated. You know, this is a, a, a yes. speed with Keanu Reeves. There is a trigger on board. If you kill me or if you try to disable it, it'll just blow up your ship. So uh, settle down, because for four days we're going to be traveling in warp 567 to this unnamed planet yes. of... Us. And who is us? Who are we? Or who are you? I thought it was kind of funny. Like, we, so we require a ship. He also says, like, we mean you no harm, which is kind of like the classic aliens, like, uh, yeah. uh, uh, arriving on Earth, we mean you no harm. Uh, Be he, not afraid. But he oh, well, that's a more biblical thing. <laughs> I mean, is there much difference, honestly, between mm, technologically superior aliens and angels and supernatural beings? And do you often, do you often uh, douse uh, men appearing in your bedroom uh, with fire retardant chemicals? If so, oh. I'm, <laughs> I'm not surprised you're still single. Sick Alan Rickman reference yes. for Dogma <laughs> by Kevin Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but Norman reveals himself to be an android by opening the flimsiest little hatch that I've ever seen. A little flap like, on his belly. It's, but, such... but it's like a tiny little cheap-ass punched-from-metal hinge yeah. that he's got there, which is like... And an invisible hinge, too. 
No, the hinge is very visible is once it? he opens it. Yeah, it's tiny, it's flimsy. It's literally the kind of hinge that you would find on a lunchbox, you know? like a, Oh, a tin. there it is, it's, right, yeah. It's just, just a little thing. Curled uh, tin, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's like the flimsiest like thing I've ever seen with highly advanced electronics and, you know, I don't know what, titanium body or whatever it is that it's made out of underneath. Oh, adaptable plastics, I think they call it later, or yes, regenerative yes, plastics. Yes, advanced yeah. plastic. Ooh. Yeah. And we're watching this time the remastered version, so this thing has lights in. And I think it was deliberately like remade to look a oh. bit more like Data. Because yeah. originally it I looked mean, more like cables and stuff, yeah. C3PO in oh, uh, right. The Phantom Menace, cables and wiring yep. and lights. But with his grim task done, Norman declares that, well, this is how it's going to be. And he just sort of shuts down. Uh, yeah, that happens after the credits, yes. Yeah. Well, and he just stands Kirk, there. Yep, I guess we're gonna be, we're in for a trip on a, for a few days. We're going on a little trip, and he's got a, Kirk has real grumpy face here. He does a bit. He, he looks rather put out, I would say. It's yeah. Like, well, f- that. Uh, like, guess we're taking an unplanned detour. I wonder if they can still radio the Federation. Ship yeah. Been taken over, but they can go like, oh hey, like yeah, we're gonna be gone for a bit. We're uh, or eject the shuttle. Mm. Dump the warp core. Uh, something anyway none of that seems to happen and for four days nothing happens because apparently like originally the arrival of the planet was going to happen in the second act right and one of the writers david gerald a staff writer on star trek a very very good one yeah can you get them to the planet quicker can you figure out how to do that we want to spend more time on the planet yes exactly so he skipped that bit and he added a few jokes in there and the the enterprise has been underway at warp seven for four days now we are entering orbit around a planet which has never been charted Norman awakes again and announces that that several people must beam down to the planets at once. Conveniently, the entire main cast. Yeah, five of them, I think. With so the exception of Scotty. Sulu, uh, Sulu could, doesn't get to come, and because uh, he had an, Scotty K had another job. Oh, so okay. T- Sulu, uh, he's he's missed, filmed, uh, certain not appearing in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> and then he was gone for a few episodes. He was filming something else. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he wasn't needed for this, and they all beam down into. My favorite set that I've ever seen on Star Trek, the original series. It's so gonzo. It's like purple lit rocks and orange and and everything's diagonal. It It looks so, it's so go-go. It reminds me a lot of that set, which which I think it was also the original series with the scary clown dude. Was that, was that another? uh... The Thor, that was Voyager. Voyager, that was, oh yes, that was it, yes. It it reminds me a lot of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, there were more rectangles there. Here, right, everything was yes. more... Uh, here is, there's like, like, there's, some bare, playhouse. there's some bare rock here. All the doors are irregular trapezoids. Yeah, amazing. All these unnecessary shapes. And immediately after being beamed down, these doors open. To a K-class planet adaptable for humans by use of pressure domes and life support systems. And we're introduced to the first of several, like, camera moves that are just absolutely brilliant in selling how many androids there are. Oh, yeah. Right, because it starts with two, I, I believe these are Alice models. I think so, yes. And then the camera sort of pans to the left and... So there's the suggestion that there are two Alice models with our heroes and two Alice models with uh, inside, with, yes, with Mud. And sometimes, yeah. like you see our hero and, and Mud, and then you see one on each side, and like oh the yeah, steps and the, the oh yes, it's very well done. So clever. Although the claim of the the writer was said like giving the impression that there are thousands on the planet. It's like, no, I mean, it's actually stated that there's only 500 of this particular model, but it's it's done very well. And Kirk recognizes Mud because yes. this is not his first appearance. Apparently, that was in Mud's Women, which we also haven't seen. Okay, yet. Okay, yes, he's a very jocular fellow. I see now again how they cast a uh, actor with similar features to uh, play Mud in Discovery. Seeing Roger Carmel's like version original makes me appreciate Rain Wilson Absolutely, even more. Yes, totally. <laughs> Laddie Buck and 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 being so casual. And again, yeah, the constantly having nicknames for everybody. Yes. And, uh, well, to be absolutely accurate, Laddie Buck. You should refer to me as Mud the First, ruler of this entire sovereign planet. And correcting people on their interpretation of his life story. And then oh, yes. He always insists on like it being just a little bit more nuanced than they like to explain. And this leads into a wonderful exchange where Harcourt Fenton Mud explains his predicament and how he came to be here. And then Kirk translated, translates it from, from bullshit yes. into reality. <laughs> I made my way off the planet, stole a ship. (laughs) (laughs) Which is payback for him. Swindler and con man. Entrepreneur. Liar and rogue. Did I leave you with that impression? (laughs) Yes. It sets up the peril, namely that our heroes have been brought here for the rest of your lives. Yes. (laughs) 
Harry Mudd is the lord of this planet and they obey his every whim. He found this planet full of helpful androids yes. and he's been ruling them. And now he's... Although, well, I mean, they don't obey his every whim because Turns they... Out. They won't let me go. They want to study me. They want to learn more about human beings. They picked a fine representative. Watch your tongue, lad. I love this sort of structure that, like, it starts off, even though he's in trouble, mm -hmm. he starts off, like, asserting power with his fiction because he loves to live in these little fictions that uh -huh. he constructs, that he's the ruler and they're in trouble, where... Whereas, actually, ooh, he kind of brought them in in hopes that the androids would then let him go, which is also not the case. Yeah. I love that scene where, like, basically he asked about the planet where he was captured when, when he was selling fake patents to the Nibians. The Nibians? Isn't that like the little... Oh, no, Devin Epp. Sorry, I had a little Star Wars moment there. I, thought I was confusing Celestens, but it was because... Uh, uh -huh. What's-his-face says uh, he did something on Den Epp 4. But that's when uh, Lando is talking to Han Solo ah, about having been made good. general. Ah, yeah. Someone must have told him about my maneuver on the Neb 4. That's oh, very, <laughs> very good. Okay, well done. I wasn't even sure about that. I had to go back and look that up because I was even thinking, is he right there? Is he wrong there? And you were... It's 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 the battle of the nab, not the nab four. But that's I'm not gonna split hairs there because you beat me on Star Wars knowledge, Kay. How does this? Is this what it's like to be a normal person talking to me? That Celestin you're thinking about? Oh, I think it was uh, recently nap, mentioned nap, by the chief. Yes, Nai Nun. Yes, who's speaking Kikuyu? Yes, it was in language. one of the episodes that would recently aired before we were recording this, so about two months ago. Well, who, who, <laughs> who, knows? Months ago. who knows how time works? <laughs> like, only very occasionally does our beloved chief engineer make it through the time vortex that seems to separate us, but only on the Patreon streams, by yeah. the way. So oh, you occasionally yes, get, yes. A, get a hangout and uh, rewatch something together. Maybe, ooh, maybe this one will be the next one that we rewatch oh, together. this was a fun one, so yes, it would yeah. definitely be a good candidate. Well, it's up to the, the, the subscribers. They get to vote on which one oh, yes. we, uh, we recap. Do you know what the penalty of a fraud Orders on Denim 5? The guilty party has his choice. Death by electrocution, death by gas, death by phaser, death by hanging. But the key word in your entire peroration, Mr. Spark, was death. So, we're out of cake, you say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, so my options are or death. <laughs> Paraphrasing of a brilliant bit by Eddie Izzard. Yes. Hey, speaking of brilliant bits, now we're introduced to the multitude of androids because while being flanked by two Alices, more uh, Alices we get a wide arrive. shot. Yes. Yeah, two Alices arrive from the side and two more Alices arrive from the other, other side. side. Yes, fantastically done. I mean, it's I, I was literally looking, sitting there watching. It's like, okay, are these just like different actresses who've been like kind of made up? Right. As I was like, yeah, well, definitely. Uh, I was fooled, I will say. Uh, it was very well done, for the, especially with the technology available at the time. Yes, and I think there was a lot of attention paid to the set design as well, mm -hmm. because it's just a three-way split screen, right? Yeah. It's a very simple uh, trick, but you've got to make sure that they don't cast shadows into each other's segments. Oh, yes. Right? And I so, guess as long as you have a fixed camera, it's easy enough to splice that together. Yeah. 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 It does take some, you know, precision oh, in uh, optical printing and editing. So that was excellent, excellently done. But it turns out that Harry Mudd has basically gotten bored. I ran out of ideas. I simply ran out of things for them to do. When they insisted I bring them more human being. He does, hey, very quickly, about the patent thing. Yeah. There may be a little bit of a warp core in that patent's exist in the Federation. Right. And, uh, and much rightfully cries, information wants to be free. Yes. Like the cry of the 90s, I believe, as the internet was being built. The Electronic Frontier Foundation would, yeah. uh, would find an ally <laughs> in, yes, uh, in Harry Mudd, as would, unfortunately, modern uh, generative AI companies God, yes. who believe that human effort does not need to be rewarded. Yes. Basically, uh, basically they want free access to uh, all uh, intellectual property so we can sell it back to other people chopped up into little bits. Yeah. Kirk's having none of it, and he the smirk. He does uh, the Kirk yes. smirk. I have it written down. He does a lot of Kirk smirking. Kirk smirk. McCoy points out there's a little dark nook. Oh, yeah. What's this? Ah, ah. Oh, oh, let this me is, show you. This is my entertainment. Well, that, gentlemen, is a shrine to the memory of my beloved Stella. His yes. beloved Stella, whom he's had recreated so that she can yell at him. Mm, Harcourt? Harcourt, Benson, Mud, what have you been up to? 
something good, I'm sure. Well, let me tell you, you lazy good for nothing. And then he can say, Shut up. And watch her just go. And then she goes like, shuts her down like a marionette and the door closes again. But he really enjoys that. Yeah, what a fun thing that I'm sure a lot well, of. It's like, well, I think of her. Husbands. I think of her constantly, and every time I do, I go further out into space. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like okay. So we can clearly see how that Mud is a troubled persona. He's a shithead, and, 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 written, and, and written for comic relief. So no, absolutely. But do you know he was almost going to have his own spin-off? Oh. Wow. Because he has a lot of fun. Oh, yes, I and guess. He, and he gets into fantastic adventures. Yeah, a roguish scoundrel. Yeah. Which I still actually would love to see a... Sorry, back on the Star Wars again. Oh. A spin-off with... Oh, now I can't remember who was the origin, the name of the original actor who played Lando Carrizian. Billy uh, D. Williams. Billy D. Williams, thank you. Basically, every episode starts with him sitting at a sabak table somewhere trying oh. to let, like run an actual story and then uh, cut as he's telling the story about something that happened cut to Daniel Glover who <gasps> then goes like well actually and then we get the episode uh, the young Indiana Jones Chronicles ex- essentially the, the yes. young Lando Calrissian <laughs> yes. Chronicles chief chief what do you think <laughs> Yes, that sounds amazing. I would love to see that happen. So maybe someday we'll see it. But in the meantime, we can at least just appreciate Billy D. Williams' beautiful, beautiful, beautiful voice. Smuggler, such a small word. I'm more of a galactic entrepreneur. That means business person. I know what it means. I mean, I used to do this every week because in Rebel Air, we had a regular segment where uh, the chief got to gush about which of the costumes he most wanted to yes. cosplay. Oh. <laughs> and I would come up with some some tie-in product or novel or story right. or whatever. Or but this is, or... this is amazing. <laughs> Very <Yes>. good. <laughs> the young Lando Calrissian. Absolutely. Oh, Chronicles, let's do it. Who would play the young Han Solo, though? I mean, uh, Alden the... Ehrlich did a, did a good job in yes, Solo. Yes, I suppose, yeah. He did. I mean, Solo is... It's not exactly... Mem- well, we're doing a Star Trek podcast, not Star Wars. Yeah, uh, Solo is a very good film. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Woody Harrelson, too. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. All right. Anyway. So our heroes are brought into their gilded cage. And they actually quite like it. Yeah. They have a little chat. This is where we have the old uh, blah, blah, blah about uh, how Mr. Mudd gave uh, them purpose after the original. They're very servile android, uh, androids. No, oh, that's it has the same Robots. Problem. Let's go robots. With robots. Let's go with robots, yes. Because despite their makers being from a different galaxy, the galaxy of Andromeda, they were quite humanoid, as you say. Right. Okay, well, convenient. Okay, great. Whatever. And, uh, uh, it saves on makeup. Oh, yeah, also. <laughs> and perhaps explains their obsession with humans in particular. Yes. Why wouldn't they be more interested I in... Think that, I think that's just because they ran into mud first and... Ooh, here's an interesting one, because he had multiple of them created, but he had no interest in the male ones, so oh, fair did point. he design the male ones, or is this what, what yeah. the makers already looked like? Mm, and maybe. Norman being unique. Right, yes. Look, they're in a lot of trouble, as Mr. Chekhov says, yeah. redundantly. Yes. And then Bones Kirk asks... Bones agrees with him. <laughs> yeah, we... Spark, and if you say we're in a lot of trouble... We are. God. We are. It's like very... <laughs> And we must direct our attack to the heart of the matter. Ooh, immediately in, on the attack. Yes. And then he says something that, as a droid rights activist, I don't really approve of, says Spock. Yeah. Obviously, this many androids cannot operate independently. Spock is definitely wearing the boots of conclusion jumping in this episode. Yes, I think so too. <laughs> and they're not capable of creative thought. But, hmm, hmm. We've been, yeah. We're about a century away from data, and that's with human technology, let alone Andromedan technology. Oh, surely less than this. Oh, no, about 70 years, yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. They're being brought to... Oh, how do you describe this? It's like... It's um, just a lounge. Well, I mean, they're all being tempted in their own way now. Right. They're being brought to different locations, or it's, at least suggested yeah. that they are. It starts with a scene where Norman is standing behind a console where Spock gets to confirm his conclusion jumping by... Uh, this would seem to be a simple relay center. Are all of you controlled through this device? And it's got this glowing... Glowing crystal thing. Like XXL yes. butt plug Oof. glowing and being, we being worshipfully we, held. We, we cannot tell if it's a butt plug because we don't know if it's got a flared base and we can't oh, see that. Fair so, enough, yeah. Like, let's not call a... things a butt plug unless we know they're safe to be used as such. <laughs> well said. If there's anything you take away from the joy of Trek, <laughs> if there's no base, it isn't safe. Mm. 
It puts a whole new purpose of getting to third base, but yeah. Yikes! <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving safely along. Uh, so this is Spock's temptation, being brought right. into the computer facilities, and Uhura's temptation is to be brought into the sort of android manufacturing location. Right, oh. a, little bit, a little bit of sexism again here. It's like, oh, the women want to be young and beautiful their entire lives. I mean... Sure, men also want to be young and beautiful their entire lives, but it's generally less emphasized in uh, art and literature. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, certainly professional women like Uhura want other things than right. youth and beauty yes. forever. Michelle Nichols. I mean, she didn't stay young, but she did stay beautiful. Oh, my God. A <laughs> breathtaking woman. And her beauty, marvelous as it is, is one of the lesser amazing qualities that a oh, woman has, yes. like her, her, her Broadway performances mm. as an actress, and most importantly, as a recruiter for NASA. Oh, you know, yes. That's the major thrust of her life. Like, she went through full preparatory training right. to experience it, uh, it physically, and, like, she was instrumental in helping NASA achieve its goals for, oh, for diversity hiring. Fantastic. I did not know that. Oh, she spent years doing it. She was, like, a spokesperson for, you know, the reason that there are black astronauts. Right. Hang on. What's the time frame for the original series play out again? 1966 through 1969, so just up until they right. So there was I think like all the air uh, before the first footstep on the moon. Right. Yeah, that sounds about right. Now I was thinking about the alternate Gemini program crew with the, the women who were selected as an alternate tra training thing. Oh, to... in the series. Wait, is that a real thing that really that is happened? Actually, I think I do believe that's a real thing, which was just like expanded in for all mankind. Yes, was, the it, series it was, by Ronald was... D. Moore. Right. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating history I, I, to discover. I, I do believe that most of those personas were actual people, just like the, the men were actual. But the, yeah, the, the women were right. just kind of like shunted off sideways in reality, whereas in uh, For All Mankind, they were uh, much more prominently. Isn't it amazing how we're still finding out that the, the role of women and our various other yes. disenfranchised groups yes. has just been sort of erased from the history that there's, we learned? There's also a fan fantastic movie about the women computers invisible finger that figures from the from the mercury program right, yes which also deals with racism in the us in general and nasa in specific at the time and uh, it's the first time that i've ever cheered a, on a scene where someone steals a library book <laughs> yes i can imagine that yes. yeah because this woman like she wanted to learn about these new computers and she wanted a, a, a book on COBOL programming which they wouldn't rent out to a colored person yeah. so yes knowledge needs to be free true yeah so just a quick little correction. It's not Invisible Figures, it's Hidden Figures based on the book by Margot Lee Shetter Lee about the lives of Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson, three mathematicians who worked as computers. Jim, you should see the research facilities. They've got a lab down there that, well, I could spend the rest of my life studying. I do so admire a man who devotes himself to knowledge. Don't lose your head, Bones. Nobody's staying anywhere. Stubborn, Kirk, stubborn. Scotty arrives. Like Captain goes like, you were ordered to stay aboard. And it's like, well, yes, I did, but they took us away. Yeah, and Mud reveals, like, oh, did I forget to tell you that I've been taking the entire crew of the Enterprise off the ship and I've replaced it by Andro uh, robots? Yeah, and Scotty was the last one. Oh, you bogus rat! <laughs> yes. It's a very, what's a bogus rat? It's yeah. like a fake yeah. rat. I mean, okay. Oh, Chekhov takes his turn on the throne and is attended by two of the, you know what? We <laughs> maybe have... Like, not being able to tell the various models of these androids apart, I've got yeah. to say. I think the clothing also gives it away. Yes, but, like, I don't know which ones are Alice's and which ones are Maureen's, so I'm just going to say... Well, these, like, are, these are specifically Alice, because it says in the subtitles. Oh! At, at least, oh, I mean, at, at least we kindly finally got to find out who the f*** Alice is. <laughs> oh, sick pop culture <laughs> reference, bro. Me I too. totally got that one. And, yes, he sits there lamenting a little bit, like, oh, it's, it's a shame, shame you're not real girls. Oh, but we are. We are programmed to function as human females, Lord. You are? Yes, my lord. <laughs> this place is even better than Leningrad. I mean, I don't know what kind of city Leningrad is in at this point, but you know. I mean, it sounds like it's like Soviet Reno. Yeah, or near Starbase sixty nine on Earth. You know? <laughs> <laughs> ah, we see that you enjoy Jamaharon. <laughs> Scotty is waxing lyrical about the technical facilities. Oh, microvision and a nanopulse laser. Hunt worked the finest tolerances. It's like, no, I mean, do you generally get better, like, tolerances with machinery rather than hand working it? But, yeah, that's, like, fair enough. <laughs> it's a beautiful prop. I think this is a prop that we see fairly... Actually, hey, Chief, do you know anything about this prop? So at first I thought that maybe you were talking about Tucker tubes, but no, those are actually in there. Or they're now called Tucker tubes thanks to lower decks. But before, there's, like, the blinking lights that has just been, like, in every science fiction property ever basically 
However, in this case, there's two objects that are here. There's one that's like a CD rack type thing. It looks like you just put CDs in there. That, as well as like the other part of it that's like kind of like on its side long ways, both of those are used in other episodes. So we have both of these together in the episode Obsession, as well as the Immunity Syndrome. Then we have a CD rack part is in Elan of Choyas. But then, like, the three cylinders with one kind of... And it, that's also in The Devil in the Dark. So, really just, hey, we made this prop. We're going to get our monies out of it and just dress it up and move it around a little bit. And we can ignore the fact that Scotty said there's never thing, anything like it when it's clearly in sick bay. It looks like a laser lathe. I mean, that's what I'm going to call it. A rudimentary lathe made no, out no, of lasers. No, it's definitely not rudimentary. It's very advanced lathe. But that's kind of what it looks to me like. It kind of looks a bit like what a lathe would look like if you had no idea what a lathe actually does. Well, as someone who doesn't really know what a lathe does, I can sort it of... Makes, it yeah, make, it makes guess. things round. Is that what it does? Essentially. I mean, that's like really oversimplifying it, but yes. Isn't it like a sort of like a pottery wheel? In a way, yes. Right? With the way you can scrape things yeah, out of yeah. a, out in, of a in, cylinder. That, that would not be a bad way to describe a lathe, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, like, when you've got one of those curvy, like, chair legs right. or whatever, that's... Yes. You put it on a lathe but, and you yeah, spin it around exactly. and you, and you yeah. scrape and shave until it's got yeah. the silhouette that you want. Hey! Hey! There you go. Very thank good. Thank you. And legs and would be yes, good I, mean, I, I know this is, like, not a correct... <laughs> but it's like, you know, if you want to explain to someone what a lathe is, that'll do. That'll do. Yes. Thank <laughs> that'll, you. Do. that'll do, Kaki. Yeah. <laughs> okay, they're all sort of gathering together and... Oh, Kirk's worry has come true. He's worried that his crew will yes. be seduced by the... Because the everybody is like, you're hitting all my people at their weakest spot. We only wish to make you happy and comfortable, Captain. And it's a very I pleasant mean, place, Captain Uhura says. It's a lovely gilded yeah. cage. They're all <laughs> very charmed by it. They're all complete unprofessional idiots. <laughs> yes. And Captain sets them right and straight. He, like, he literally sets Chekhov straight. He like pulls him up. Yes, yes. He, so, does, he does a lot sort of criticising Chekhov's yes. posture. Throughout this episode as well, the floor is no place for an officer, Mr. Chekhov. Do you require something, Lord? No. Yes, my ship. I am not programmed to, to respond, respond in, in that, that area. area. Yes, I know. Which yes. is their default, like, I don't want to talk about this. That would probably be a good thing to do in my own relationships. Like, I'm not programmed to respond in that area whenever... <laughs> no? Oh, wow. Well. I see a terrified look on your face. Don't think no. that's good relationship advice. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's 2024, so I'd probably go with, <clears throat> according to OpenAI policy, we're not able to comply... <laughs> Zing! <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh, hey, if you're listening to this in the future and you don't know what that means, oh, what a nice future you live in. Yeah. Congratulations, we survived. We shall serve you to your best interests to make you happy. But we're unhappy here. Please explain unhappy. Which is kind of odd that they don't understand that if, like, wants and desires are not reserved, which is what Kirk tells them. Yes. We want Enterprise. The Enterprise is not a want or a desire. It is a mechanical device. No, it's a beautiful lady and we love her. And we see the first time that like they, they kind of go space out as their necklace glows and they are com uh, communicating with the hive mind, as it turns out, because the little console that Norbert was fondling... Uh, What's his name? Norman. Norman. Yes. Norbert, yeah, uh, turns out to be like the, the central communications hub. Which yeah. allows all the individual robots to basically mind melt and put all their computational power together to basically decide on an issue. Yes, yes. Because the first time that he tries to exploit that, we get some excellent dialogue about this. Illogical, illogical. All units relate. All units, Norman, coordinate. Right. So they're a distributed oh, yes. intelligence. Like, all the units are participating in the process. Yeah. I guess Norman functions like a hypervisor, you know, guess, in a multi-threading yeah, yeah. computational sense, environment. Yeah. yeah, Kirk is really... He really doesn't, like, trust his crew to resist the temptation of this no, place No, he does not. Much. Which, which is actually very well played upon later with Uhura. But, yes, they basically go to check out Mud, who is under the impression that he is about to leave. And the androids reveal, no, Lord Mud. Yes, and Norman declares that he they always knew that he was a flawed example of humankind yes. from the moment they met him, and they've been deceiving him. They've used him to get more humans, but they absolutely won't let him leave. We cannot allow any race as greedy and corruptible as yours to have free run of the galaxy. 
basically make the rest of the universe really happy by subverting them and controlling them and serving them. Yes. We're going to be topping from the bottom. We're going to yeah. be serving and controlling Very them. Very good point, yes. They'll become so totally dependent on off, but just the humans. So that gets everybody's head back on straight. Yep. And where previously they and were... we shall serve them and you will be happy and controlled. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, some people would be. Mm-hmm. Hey, some people are into that. Yeah. Hell yeah. Now all the so, temptation is gone. Yeah. We get to the whole point. There's a whole show, a song and dance routine, which is being made about how they can infuse... Don't the... say song and dance routine in an episode that actually contains a song and dance well, routine. I mean, I thought it was a pro- rather appropriate. Oh, okay, fair <laughs> enough. There is a, there is literally, metaphorical. There is, no, there is literally an metaphorical song and dance routine, which is already kind of preempted by this whole thing is here, because, like, we want everybody to be happy. But you can't. Yeah. Because there are going to be conflicting thoughts and desires. Some people want yes. this, some people want that, and those are permanently, irredeemably in opposition to each other, contradictory yeah. to each other. That's why you have compromise. Yes, and exactly. Have- so it's like that, that already should throw them into a logic loop that makes them die out as soon as they get into humans. I mean, any species, honestly. Right. Like, imagine them actually dealing with Vulcans and then realizing the tremendous internal inconsistency of Vulcan values. Oh, yes. Right? Highly emotional people and desperate not to show it to anybody. Right. Which you can describe as hypocrisy, but it's also like, it's just a cultural value. Yeah. Deeply inconsistent, and therefore uh, the culture is a product of compromise, as all cultures are. All right, what have we got to work with? Well, Captain, androids and robots, but they're just not capable of independent creative thought. Yet the device that Norman claims to be their central control is totally inadequate to the task of directing more than 200,000 of them. I do like that Spock comes in with a whole lot of information, and then yeah. McCoy goes, how do you know? Well, I, I asked them. Yeah, <laughs> like, which is like, yeah, perfectly cool. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Kirk goes, yeah, they, okay. they don't expect us to be able to do anything. No. Them. Why wouldn't they tell us? Mud is skeptical at first, but soon enough willing to play along to GTFO, because he wants out. Yes, He's doing something that we saw Rain Wilson do as well. And it's so interesting to having seen his performance as Harry Mudd first and then seeing Roger Carmel's performance because, like, now he's turning over to expecting the crew to solve his problems for him. Now that they're in the same boat, now he's very critical of them. Yeah. And you should be doing better to get us out of here. (laughs) Yes. Such a self-centered man. And they start sort of bullying him and sort of gathering around him And once he offers to help. Well, the only thing that we need from you is to die. Oh, no, just to fall asleep. And he's forcibly yes. injected and becomes part of their ruse. Because that is, yeah, this is where we get Kirk going to talk to Alice and tell him, that, yeah, we need medical supplies here. Is this not Alice? Is it I, Maureen? I think it's an Alice, but... I mean, they have these helpful necklaces with numbers on them yeah, to but be able to tell them apart, but that be... doesn't tell you the, no, the model. No, exactly. Also, does it matter? I don't know. I, I do like to, you know, address people with the name that, that right. they address themselves with, right? No, totally, but, I mean, it depends on how much their hive minds, you know, or if it only works. Well, I guess it only happens when they do the blinky thing and then uh, confer with everybody else. Yeah, yeah. But the ruse continues as uh, not just we have to have the medical supplies, but uh, as soon as Alice comes into the room to check it out, Uhura... They're lying. It's a trick. Dr. McCoy injected something in Harry Mudd to make him look sick. It's a trick to get back on board and sabotage the ship. Says Alice, we will not be obeying your order. And then Kirk comes up to Uhura, so threatening, yeah. grabs her by the shoulders and then shakes her. Beautiful, Uhura, beautiful. beautiful yes. <laughs> we never hear again here from the thing is where uh, she says, like, yes, I want to have my brain placed in an android body. And Alice goes, like, the programming for your body will be completed before we leave. You have been of assistance. We shall fulfill our obligation. And we never hear from that again. Thank Christ, honestly, because, oof. Oh, that would have been a fun scene, though. You know, brain getting scooped out and being put in, like, uh, you know, as in Lex, you know, when his, wow. his merciful shadow is uh, taken out of the body and the brain gets yeah. put out as a, one of his, the, uh, what's yeah. it called, the, the something? And the divine predecessors. Divine predecessors, yes. that's no, the word. I know yes. the, <laughs> the, the amazing. Do you know the, the beautiful brain scoop ladle that they have? Yes, I do, but <laughs> you preface this with fun scene. <laughs> so you and I have some, some differing, I mean, yes, Lex is a masterpiece <laughs> of German-Canadian erotic misanthropy. Yes. Which thing is a really, really, really tight description of a truly amazing series. And now comes the true song and dance routine. Yes, they start on a 
plot to confuse the robots by doing weird, irrational, illogical But perfectly things. choreographed and clearly rehearsed. Oh, yes, totally. Scripted things. Like, when did they have the opportunity to write this down? And, like, did they sort of... Yeah. Brainstorm on how to do this exactly? Maybe we should start... Maybe they're just really good at improv theatre. Whoa, yeah. It's like, guys, it's just like Improv Friday on the Enterprise. Yeah, just do that. <laughs> yeah. So McCoy and Scotty start by flanking the door yeah. and, and playing these invisible instruments and Chekhov and Uhura come waltzing through. What are they doing? They're celebrating. They're celebrating their captivity and, yeah. their, and their unhappiness. And Well, that makes them sort of blink like fembots uh, <laughs> yes. being, being talked to death by Austin Powers. Very good, yes. Because apparently, like, talking the computer to death is something that Kirk and co. do quite a lot. It, uh, yes. L logic bombs get diffused by that, and... I wonder, hey, Chief, is this the first or, like, later? Like, how, how many of these talk the computer to death episodes have there been at this point? So by this point, there had been a few instances of it. There was one in The Return of the Archons. There was one in The Ultimate Computer. There was one in The Changeling. Then there was this one with iMud. And after this one, there was also Requiem for Methuselah. And there's some similar cases of doing stuff to make the computer or an android or whatever uh, freak out and not really understand what's going on, such as what are little girls made of, Wolf in the Fold, and arguably the invasive program that Data and Jordy inserted with I Borg into a Borg hive mind. So that's some instances of this trope happening. But no, this is not the first instance of this happening by any stretch. Wow. Oh. Oh. I wasn't expecting that specific answer. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> So yes, there's, there's one this beautiful sort of dancing here and this curtsy, this enormous curtsy that Uhura does before oh, slapping yes. Chekhov. Absolutely fantastic. Mr. Chekhov. The floor is no place for an officer. Attention! Yeah, he tells Chekhov to stand absolutely still, and he goes dancing and he's like approves of it and like really confusing uh, Alice. I wonder if, like, improv theatre or, like, absurdist theatre mm. were popular forms of entertainment at this time. So oh, these okay. kinds of... I mean, yeah, really, right? In the UK, you'd have Monty Python by now. Monty yes. Python was just about airing, or they were definitely performing. Yeah, yeah. So that, that sort of new wave of countercultural comedy and performance would absolutely yeah. be... It's, it's pretty go-go. This shuts down the two Alices. Spock has another mission, so Completely, he's on a uh, different... Yes, he's no, no, he's, he's, he's basically doing the same thing, but he's doing the science and logic way. He's in the lab that uh, Scotty was with a laser lathe. Earlier. Yes. Oh yeah, he tries to nerve pinch a. He tries uh, to nerve pinch the robot. Ro doesn't work. Uh, Is there any significance to this gesture? Uh, no. No, no, nothing. Don't, don't forget about it. And so, he... I love you. However, I hate you. But. I'm identical in every way with Alice 27. Yes, of course. That is exactly why I hate you. Because you are identical. Yes. Which goes like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> and they also sort of shut down. So success. We've, yes, uh... success, Captain. We've shut down four. No, we only have 207,483 left. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. Because they figured out that Norman must be the central locus. Yes. And I figured that out earlier. I thought it was very clever. Because oh. When Norman said how many androids there were, it was an odd number. No. Oh, very good. Right? Yes. And we've seen them all in pairs yeah, yeah. And, and multiples. So I was already figuring that he was a prime unit, which we discover when he walks around from behind his console and... Wow, that boy needed a dance belt. Like, if this oh. is him wearing a dance belt already, then right. boy, howdy. Well, I mean, like, we found a good co-star for David Bowie in... Uh, <laughs> uh, Labyrinth. Labyrinth, thank you. Yes, yes. The, uh, but uh, we, we can't take your eyes off and imagine playing with his balls. <sighs> they corner Norman behind his console, uh, and then, uh, yeah, they start playing the whole th same game to him, just, like, confusing him with illogical inconsistencies and... Yes, and just bizarre poetry, you know, logic is little tweeting bird chirping yes. in the meadow. Logic is a wreath of pretty flowers which smell bad. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's not illogical. Flowers can be very pretty and still smell like death. Oh, yeah. You know, that I makes no sense. <laughs> that's... But yes, I was just completely, just, just totally absorbed by the lump in his pants. By oh the, yes, I believe the greatest generation folks call that a moose knuckle. Oof. 
Yes, as opposed to a camel toe. Yes. Yes. No, absolutely. Uh, Scotty is overcome by happiness and asks uh, to be killed. I'm tired of happiness. I'm tired of comfort and pleasure. I'm ready. Kill me. Kill me. What did they do? They, <laughs> they all point their fingers and yes. they do the warbling whistle together. It's <laughs> Just like we rehearsed everyone. Yes. <laughs> Which confuses them even more. Oh, you can't have done that. They just an object work now, I think, as it's known in improv theatre, where Spock produces uh, the explosive. Oh, of yes. His shirt. There's a little bit of a, hand, a weird handoff where he pitches it to Mud. Who, oh, 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 almost drops it, but no, he catches it behind his back <laughs> and everyone's tremendously pleased. Detonator. Fuse. Primer. Mashing. Power primer. Fuse. Yes. Mashy. I don't know what a mashy is, but... A drink, maybe? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he, Jeez, yeah, what's he, a mashy? He... Okay, well, that's that's interesting. So, at first, I was l- listening back to it over and over and over, and I'm like, I feel like they're saying matchstick. But no, it's instead a type of golf club. At this point now, it's an obsolete golf club, but effectively like a, a five iron. Uh-huh. Oh, Didn't I wasn't expect expecting that. that. Yeah, oh, no, damn it! <laughs> uh, and, uh, yes, uh, he plays it like it's a golf club. Yeah, it's a mashy, okay? Come on, don't you know what a mashy is? Everyone knows what a mashy is, right? <laughs> right? Illogical, illogical, and smoke comes out of his head. Yes. Uh, Very well done, in fact, there. And Norman has a dick aneurysm uh, and collapses. Wow. All right, which allows them to somehow reprogram all the androids yeah. yeah yeah so in between scenes suddenly everything is fine we're back in control of the enterprise and they're being reprogrammed to their original purpose which woof. i guess it's like yeah they're basically undoing what mud did to them it's an awfully quick resolution to an incredibly dangerous yeah situation, well, you know this think. is like this is star trek you know this is like we've just had the last commercial break and we are down for the resolution and the lead into the next show on which is going to air after more commercials because this is American TV that this end aired on. Yep. McCoy gloats to Spock like oh how how disappointing it must be to see that this this perfect society that was so logical and just like you and we irrational humans whipped them in a fair fight. Yeah. And now you have to go back to to living <laughs> among us. Oh, and he's like well which I find eminently satisfactory doctor for nowhere am I so desperately needed as among a shipload of illogical humans. And yes, you're right, Spock. Nowhere are you more desperately needed than in the, the captain's laundry hamper. But you are forgetting about Mud, who is under the impression that he will be leaving with the crew. Yes. When, in fact, he is being condemned by Kirk to live on this planet. And uh, he's like, oh, well, I guess I can suffer this... Pleasure escape. Yes, and we've even like created an entire range of robots specifically to cater to your every whim. Right. Harcourt, Harcourt, <laughs> Fenton, Mud, and it's you've Stella. You've been drinking again. You've been eating too much. And this time she won't shut up. Oh, and there's no like, chance. And not is it just Stella? It is like another Stella. Stella and then a, th- a third Stella shows up, and she has like a f- number five hundred on her. I oh, mean, this is a bit of. You know, psychological punishment that they're inf- yeah, inflicting on him. If not torture. Yeah. Like permanent <laughs> imprisonment without trial. Yeah. On a plan. This is, this is incredibly dangerous it stuff is. here. But we're all just having a... We're all just having a laugh at his expense. And everyone just walks away. And uh, the Enterprise warps away from this honestly beautiful in the remastered version planet. Yeah. It's got these beautiful rings. It's cake class, so not very nice outside. But we are once we're in the dome. Yeah, and we're all done. All's well that ends yes. well. Yes. You know, Except was, for mud. Yeah, I, I was I was left with some seriously like <laughs> I, I found that very unpleasant as it, an ending. It doesn't seem to be fitting a uh, Starfleet crew. Well, I guess that's how plots were resolved back in those days. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's played for laughs, but you know, if you think about it, it's kind of horrific. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's enough of that. Oh, I've had an idea for what we can call our deleted scene segment. Okay, do go on. Captain's log, supplemental. Oh, very good. Yeah, supplemental material that we imagine was omitted from this series. And it's it's one of our little funny recap opportunities. What I kind of would have wanted to see 
is the all crew orgy slash bacchanal, which yes, is going yes, on at the and same time uh, as, as this whole thing is being resolved, because the entire crew has been moved off the Enterprise. Uh, oh yes, uh, and only so the bridge crew has Kirk there whipping them into shape, and exactly, everybody else everybody is just losing just like themselves. Having like, fun. Yeah. But, oh, they're all fully functional. But oh yes, even the males want to have oh, their purposes. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, but no, really, what I, what would even be even funnier would be a scene where Spock is like trying to get the Alice's to shut down, uh, oh, yeah. and where he does the uh, he tries the nerve pinch on them, and he just like, goes to the screen, and he kind of looks like funny. That doesn't work. So then he grabs himself by the neck and pinches himself out to see whether or not he's <laughs> did I do that right? And he grabs himself and he falls over. <laughs> Well, it doesn't quite work on yourself, though. Maybe if, if he sits on know. his hand for about five I minutes. I was going to say, do a stranger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so mine's a little bit more outlandish. Okay, go on. Because I was thinking about how one of the best Star Trek films uh, in the original series sort of run was based on an episode of the original series yeah. where the antagonist was marooned on a planet and left to rot there. Wrath of Khan. So I'm thinking the Wrath of Mud. Oh, Right? Well, and let's have him played by Ricardo Montalban, because why the not? Okay, yeah. Right? And and he's left on, this is Deneb 5! <laughs> and, he, and he has to trick, you know, Chekhov or whoever into uh, surrendering the Enterprise and seizes the Genesis device into making another planet full of hot babes, my true... Yes, because uh, more sexism is always good. Yeah, and he would also quote Shakespeare, right? Plenty of oh. Shakespeare to be, uh, yeah, yeah. to be quoted here. There's so, quite yes. a bit of Shakespeare around. Cool, yeah. One day, if we, if we reach work. the point where like fan art becomes a thing for our podcast, then I very, very much want a poster for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Mud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you can ask some AI to make it for you. N- uh, no. No. This is... No. AI is not... Okay. What is this? Okay, that, that's, uh, it's literally called Fire All Weapons. Oh, Okay. If anyone else is wondering, yes, I too jumped out of my chair when I heard that because holy shit, cocky. Oh, I've got another one. Let me see. Unable to comply. See that one? Yeah. Maybe maybe that one's more sensible. Okay. Right. But, so, okay, let's find out. Our chief engineer has provided us, us again with a few uh, samples from uh, next week's episode. So we get to sit and speculate and see if we can guess what it is before it all is revealed. Yeah. So let's start with... Are we still pretending... Apparently so. Okay, Are we that's still line pretending? one. Okay, I immediately know it. I, oh, I, 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 I mean, already I, I immediately imme- know what this is. I immediately went to a Father of the Pride episode, but... Oh. <laughs> Where the grandfather, speaking about the son they ask, of they the ask lion the kid family. is like he's sitting in the bathtub listening to Tori Amos, and Grandpa goes like, Are we still pretending he's not gay? <laughs> Somebody out here ought to have a little hope. Oh. Oh, hmm. So are we still pretending and somebody, somebody out here ought to have a little hope? Okay. Yeah. No. You need a feather in your hat. Oh, is this like the episode where Q oh, you're gets at a the huge get the, disadvantage? Gets the crew of the Enterprise as merry men and like uh, Rob and uh, Worf is like, sir, I'm not a merry man. <laughs> oh, let's find out. We got one more. After they brought you back from your time in the collective. Do you honestly feel like you've regained your humanity? Oh, okay. So it's a next generation late series episode with. Are you talking about Picard here? Is it we are else? talking about Picard, but not yeah. in the way you think, because oh. listen. Picard, season one, episode five, Stardust oh. City Rag. Yeah. Right. There we go then. Okay. Okay. Thank you for I'm... coming to listen to us, and we shall see you next week with Picard Series 1, Episode 5. So looking forward to it, because it, hey, for everyone who maybe hasn't seen it before, if you're about to watch it, the opening is rough. Okay. It's a really rough opening scene. I'm saying this to you, Kay, as well. All right. So just, like, squint your eyes and, like, prepare yourself for that, and then after that, the episode is actually a lot of fun, okay. and then the ending is a little bit rough as well. Right. But in the middle, we're going to have a lot of fun. Well. And in the meantime... I'm but leaving Starfleet. Uh, I'm leaving Starfleet. Oh. Energize. Energize. We're doing the energy. Oh, we're sorry. Sorry. We're we're changing. We're we're changing. Changing. We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode with your friends Kay and Kaki, production and editing by your chief engineer, Greg, and music by Fox Amore. Join us next time for Stardust City Rag from Picard Season 1, Episode 5. Visit joyoftrek.com slash links to send us your recommendations, support us on Patreon, or to find us on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening to The Joy of Trek, and we'll see you out there.